Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Brad Muscle, and this will be my final reading of The Utility of Religion, Mill, Nietzsche, and James. This will be the conclusion of the book. Again, this is conclusion. As we have seen, Mill, Nietzsche, and James have much to say about the utility of religion, and attempting to formulate conclusions based on their extensive and often conflicting reflections is not a very straightforward task. Nevertheless, despite the difficulty of the undertaking, I am convinced that some conclusions regarding the utility of religion can be defended. In the following, I briefly summarize my primary observations from each chapter and establish what I think we may generally conclude from these observations. I end by articulating the need for a more sustained study of the utility of religion, a la James's call for a science of religion, and by offering suggestions regarding how to best facilitate this study in the future. Let me begin by saying that I think James makes a good point in suggesting that we ought to try to develop a science of religion in an effort to analyze religion in a more useful way. I agree with much of his criticism of the philosophy of religion and his conclusion that it is generally unable to adequately assess the value of religion. As Proudfoot suggests, quote, a science of religions can tell us which faiths have worked best in a way that no rationalist analysis can. In Varieties, James proposes that philosophy of religion can be replaced by such a science of religions, and he hopes that the book will make a con contribution to it, end quote. Footnote 706 cites the source. Moreover, I think the impetus for much of the animosity toward religion is likely the dubious philosophical and dogmatic intellectual arguments offered on its behalf, which James focuses on, and in my opinion, rightly derides in his lecture on philosophy. Footnote 707 cites the source. In my judgment, some are put off by the lack of a sound intellectual basis for such religious belief, which is further compounded by the insistence on the part of some theologians and philosophers that there is one that they fail to recognize that it might nevertheless prove useful despite any intellectual shortcomings. Thus, I certainly appreciate James's desire to emphasize the effects of religion on our everyday lives, as his science of religion is intended to do, rather than to toil in the intellectual discussions comprising the philosophy of religion. In chapter 1, we saw how Mill distinguishes between religion's social utility and individual utility. I think this is a useful distinction with which to start an analysis of the utility of religion as it reflects what are arguably the two most common claims offered in support of religion's usefulness. One, religion is morally useful, and two, religion makes individuals happy. Interestingly, we saw how differently Mill viewed the utility of religion from the perspective of society as opposed to the perspective of individuals. As I suggested, I believe Mill makes a very strong case against the thesis that religion is morally useful. I agree with this assertion that religion often receives credit for teaching and enforcing morality when, in fact, deeper underlying forces are likely responsible for these effects, and I think he makes a strong case for, for why religion can even be morally problematic. Additionally, I discussed research on the relationship between religion and morality which, at best, fails to substantiate any positive correlation between religion and morality. I do not mean to suggest that religion is, religion is altogether incapable of inspiring moral, be, moral behavior. But I do believe, as Mill argued, that most people probably vast, vastly overstate the moral utility of religion. In my, the, my view, Mill is justified in trying to divorce religion from the good moral consequences so often associated with it. And I believe he is generally successful in his attempts to undermine arguments in favor of religion's social utility. However, we also saw how Mill was not so inclined to dismiss arguments in favor of the individual utility of religion. Indeed, he conceded that religion pr produces existential relief for individuals, i.e. religion makes some individuals happy. But he questioned whether supernatural religion is necessary and or optimal for this kind of relief. In turn, he suggested that supernatural re religion is neither necessary nor optimal for such relief, and in the process he elaborated on other viable alternatives, such as patriotism and his own religion of humanity. While I think that his alternatives might prove to be generally effective, I express concerns about their adequacy in all cases. That is, I granted the Mill's alternatives can suffice for some, but I suggest that there might be others for whom a supernatural remedy is still required. Ultimately, I concluded chapter one by agreeing, agreeing with Mill that the case for religion's social utility is unconvincing, and in subsequent chapters, I turned to a more detailed analysis of the case for its individual utility, which seemed much more promising. In chapter two, I presented Nietzsche's case against religion, religion's individual utility. On his account, religion is problematic for individuals because it entails self-deception and it's unhealthy. Nietzsche, a thoroughgoing naturalist, describes religion on the basis of its anti-natural and supernatural tendencies, 
which appeal to something beyond the natural world and thus entail deception. In lieu of religious values, which he believes propagates weakness and disease, Nietzsche maintains that individuals ought to instead uphold more natural and life-affirming values, which are said to spawn a more vigorous and healthy mentality. While I agreed that religion is commonly associated with deception, I expressed my doubts regarding Nietzsche's contention that it is implicitly unhealthy. I cited, among other things, his own reflections on the slave mentality, which seemed to suggest that supernatural religion is a natural consequence of the human condition. In other words, some, and perhaps many, may require supernatural religion in order to cope with earthly life, in which case it would seem to be a necessary component in their prescription for a healthy life. Thus, I concluded chapter 2 by arguing that Nietzsche's conception of health is inadequate, and that, as a result, his categorical misgivings about the utility of religion for individuals are mis is unfounded. Having granted that it may de entail deception, I remained unconvinced that religion is necessarily unhealthy for individuals, and in turning to chapter 3, I began to wonder whether the opposite might, in fact, be the case. Perhaps, as James maintains, religion is instead necessarily healthy and regenerative. In chapter 3, I presented James's case for religion's individu individual utility, which is predicated on his notion that religion is, by definition, a healthy and optimistic phenomenon. On his account, although it is complicated and multifaceted, religion is always essentially positive and regenerative, thanks to the process of conversion implicit in it, which reflects the elimination of psychological discord within an individual. James expounds on the many benefits he associates with individual religion, and he downplays the harms he links to it. According to James, some people are plagued by overwhelming fixations on the evils of earthly life that can only be alleviated by religion, and others who may not require religion in order to be happy are still happier as a result of their religion. He suggests that the harms associated with religion can usually be traced back to the excesses of overindulgent and inferior intellects, and that as humanity continues to become more refined, these excesses will become less prevalent and problematic. Ultimately, I argued that James makes a very good case for religion's individual, individual utility, but I express my concerns that he is, he is nevertheless overstating his case against the prospects of purely natural worldviews. While I agreed that he demonstrated the usefulness of supernatural religion for some individuals, I suggest that he nevertheless underestimates the prospects for happiness without it. Recall that James submits that a serious and reflective individ individual cannot help but experience sadness when thinking about the evils inherent in earthly life, and that long-lasting happiness and existential peace requ require him or her to appeal to something beyond the natural world. I suggest that the James's view seems to reflect his, un own, his own unduly skeptical view of purely natural world views, and I argued that while making supernatural appeals might be necessary for existential relief in some cases, it still nevertheless seems possible in other cases to secure a similar kind of relief without making such appeals. Hence, Nietzsche's naturalism may not prove to be satisfactory for the majority of people, as I argued in chapter 2 and as James suggests, but I do believe it is, in fact, satisfactory in some cases, as I argued in chapter 3 and contrary to what James suggests. I also express concerns about James's notion that religion is always positive and regenerative in nature, since there seem to be individuals that we are inclined to classify as religious who do not fit his optimistic description. In this dissertation, I have aimed to catalog some of the harms and benefits properly ascribed to religion. I hope to have established that, although religion yields little moral utility and even seems to be morally problematic, it proves useful for some individuals insofar as it provides significant existential relief. Now, contrary to what James suggests, and in accordance with what Mill and Nietzsche assert, I maintain that some people are nevertheless capable of experiencing similar existential relief and happiness by purely natural means. Still, I believe James is right to emphasize that there are, there, there are those who seem to require supernatural re religion in order to experience such relief. In this case, supernatural religion is vitally useful for the mental well-being of these individuals, which I think Mill, to a lesser extent, and Nietzsche, to a greater extent, fail to adequately appreciate. Ultimately, I am not sure that we will ever have an answer to the question, why? I.e., why is there something and not nothing? Until we do, I believe that religion will continue to exert a significant positive influence on the lives of some, perhaps most, people, which surely merits consideration and analysis of the utility of religion. However, while there may be, may be as I've argued, individuals who profit from religion in this manner, the harms associated with religions must still be considered. Specifically, I am worried that religion may be morally problematic, as Mill suggested, 
and I am concerned about some of the deception and intellectual difficulties linked to religion, which Mill and Nietzsche referred to. Hence, granting that religion produces positive effects for many individuals, potential harms associated with religion must still be factored into an assessment of its overall utility, and I believe that weighing these benefits and harms against each other is the primary task awaiting those who wish to contribute to James's science of religion in the future. If, for example, it were established that religion is actually negatively correlated with morality, then that consideration would need to be duly weighed against the individual utility of religion. With this in mind, consider for a moment the religion causes violence thesis that was mentioned many times throughout this dissertation. Although I'm not fully committed to the notion that religion is positively, positively correlated with violence, I have expressed concerns that it may be. To be sure, there are those who assert religion does propagate violence. For instance, I have referenced Sam Harris, who claims religion is inherently divisive. While examining the merits of Harris's arguments for this position lies beyond the scope of this dissertation, I do believe his initial worry is warranted. Hence, although I think the relationship between religion and violence is anything but clear, I do believe it is worthwhile to investigate the relationship further in order to try to shed light on the matter, contrary to what William T. Kavanaugh suggests in his article, does religion cause violence? Behind the common question lies a morass of unclear thinking. Footnote 708 cites the source. Kavanaugh challenges the notion that religions like, quote, Christianity, Islam, and other faiths are more inclined toward violence than ideologies and, and institutions that are identified as secular, end quote. Footnote 709 cites the source. And he suggests that the problem with those advancing the religion causes violence argument is their, quote, inability to find a convincing way to separate religious violence from secular violence, end quote. Footnote 710 cites the source. <clears throat> Briefly, Kavanaugh contends that it is difficult, if not impossible, to disentangle religion from other social processes and institutions. And he suggests that, quote, religion was not considered something separable from such political institutions until the modern era, end quote. Footnote 711 cites the source. As a result, substantiating the religion in particular is the root of violence becomes problematic. He also alludes to the disparate conceptions of religion, which he argues makes it all the more difficult to establish a meaningful link between religious and religion and violence. To be sure, I think much of what Kavanaugh says is fair and well-reasoned. He raises some excellent points that must be addressed by anyone advocating the position that religion causes violence. And, as we have seen, religion is indeed a notoriously vague concept which makes it more difficult for, for religion causes violence theorists to substantiate their arguments. Kavanaugh is also right to suggest that it is hard to isolate religion from other social factors with which it seems so intertwined, like politics, culture, and education. Kavanaugh's concerns are even more global and worrisome than they initially seem, as his analysis calls into question the very prospects of analyzing the utility of religion at all, since the upshot of his argument is that we cannot clearly distinguish what religion even is, or adequately separate, separate it from other potential causal factors. As he puts the point, quote, what does or does not count as religion is based on subjective and indefensible assumptions, end quote. Footnote 712 cites the source. In this case, Kavanaugh's concerns also threaten the very foundation of James's science of religion. After all, how can we propose to measure the effects of religion on our daily lives if we cannot even establish what religion is? Throughout this dissertation, I have echoed some of Kavanaugh's concerns and referred to many conceptual difficulties associated with defining religion. In chapter one, for instance, I noted that Mill defines religion in a very general manner, but then proceeds to focus on something much more specific, i.e. supernatural religion, in his actual analysis of the utility of religion. Moreover, I express concerns about defining religion in such a broad manner to begin with, as both Mill and James do. Specifically, such a broad definition of religion would seem to incorporate belief systems that some are hesitant to associate with religion, including many ostensibly secular commitments, such as patriotism. Kavanaugh reflects on this point, writing, quote, a survey of religious studies, studies literature finds totems, witchcraft, the rights of man, Marxism, liberalism, Japanese, Japanese tea ceremonies, nationalism, sports, free market ideology, and a host of other institutions and practices treated under the rubric religion, end quote. Footnote 713 cites the source. As opposed to Mill and James, Nietzsche works with a more specific conception of religion, focusing primarily on supernatural religions like Christianity. As I have argued, these conceptual differences surely influence these thinkers' assessments of religion's utility. If Nietzsche was working with, working with James's broader conception of religion, which I have suggested even includes Nietzsche's own fervent naturalism, <coughs> excuse me, 
then surely he would, he would have reached more favorable con conclusions regarding religion's utility. In view of these conceptual difficulties and Kavanaugh's concerns, I think it is imperative that, imperative that anyone contributing to the discussion of religion's utility stipulate what different definition of religion they intend to work with, which, to their credit, both Mill and James do. However, Kavanaugh suggests that issues persist even if one tries to offer clear definitions. Quote, if one tries to limit the definition of religion to belief in God or gods, then certain belief systems that are usually called religions are eliminated, such as Theravada Buddhism and Confucianism. If the definition is expanded to include such belief systems, then all sorts of practices, including many that are usually labeled secular, fall under the definition of religion. End quote. Footnote 714 cites the source. Nevertheless, despite such concerns, I believe it is important to keep in mind that the term religion is not vacuous. If it were, it would be difficult to ascertain how Kavanaugh can be so sure that there is, in fact, something that is intertwined with the other institutions he mentions, i.e., what is it that he claims cannot be isolated from these other institutions? I agree that trying to validate any thesis re related to religion is, is a difficult endeavor because considerable legwork is involved, but I disagree with Kavanaugh's conclusion, which I believe is too strong. Yes, the distinction between religious and secular institutions may be mystifying, and at times misleading if the legwork is not properly done. But that does not mean that it is altogether unhelpful. Uh, footnote 715. The terms inside quotation marks are the words he uses voices his, voicing his concerns. And those, I'll read that again. Yes, the distinction between, between religious and secular institutions may be mystifying and at times misleading if the legwork is not properly done, but that does not mean that it is altogether unhelpful. And then footnote 715 says, the terms inside quotation marks are the words he uses in voicing his concerns. So those were his words. Uh, end of footnote 715. Kavanaugh is essentially suggesting that the case for, for religion causing violence can't be made because the term religion is vague. It would seem then that for the same reason, he would have a problem with anyone invoking the term religion in any discussion. Shall we not per permit ourselves to use the term at all? Antagonism toward the concept of religion itself certainly seems to be the upshot of his analysis, but I want to be sure to avoid a slippery slope fallacy here. If Kavanaugh's position is to be interpreted less extremely, then further explanation is required regarding the point at which the term religion ceases to be problematic for the reasons he articulates. In other words, how can how and sorry, in other words, how can the issue he raises ever be eradicated in any discussion? If Kavanaugh wishes to avoid association with the extreme position that renders the term religion incapable of ever serving a useful purpose, then I think he owes us some explanation as how as to how or when it can be used without meeting the same pitfalls that plague it within discussions regarding the religion causes violence thesis. Whether it is ultimately Kavanaugh's stance or not, I believe such an extreme position is certainly unreasonable. It is impossible to avoid vagueness altogether. There is almost always a way to phrase our thoughts more precisely. After all, even the term vague is vague. Clearly, we cannot and should not avoid speaking when vagueness is inevitable, or else we would arguably never speak. Just as clearly, we can see that even in instances where vagueness is unavoidable, we can still convey what we mean and gain something from doing so. Hence, speaking in such circumstances is still useful, contrary to what Kavanaugh implies. Consider, for example, the following scenario. Lost while on vacation, I ask where a historic stadium is located, and a stranger replies, quote, a long way away from here, buddy, end quote. What the stranger said is vague, and it certainly draws my ire, as I wish he'd be more specific, but it is nonetheless useful since I had been under the impression that I was very close to the stadium. So too, just because religion is vague, is a vague term, doesn't mean that it can't nonetheless be employed in a useful manner. Footnote 716. Perhaps Kavanaugh wants to make the case that it is a matter of degrees, i.e. some vague terms can be useful, but religion is so vague that it cannot be. In this case, he still has, owes us more explanation. Specifically, at what point does a term become too vague to be useful? As is, his account of the connection between the vagueness of terms and their usefulness is vague. End of footnote 716. I believe we can speak of religion in a meaningful and useful manner, provided we set the necessary foundation and carefully distinguish, as best we can, what exactly we, we propose to signify by our employment of the term. Thus, the key to a fruitful discussion of the relationship between religion and violence, or of anything pertaining to religion, is to once again, clarify as much as possible at the outset what we mean when we use the critical terms involved. Others may disagree with what we have to decide, what we have decided to include or exclude by defining the terms in the manner we do, 
but we can still establish fruitful findings regarding the phenomenon of religion as we've chosen to consider it. All of this goes to show that using the empirical method championed by James in an effort to continue exploring the effects of religion is not a futile endeavor, as Kavanaugh seems to believe. Rather, I believe it is a task well worth the attention of future scholarship. It is, as I have indicated, also pursuant to James's science of religion, toward, toward which I ultimately hope this dissertation con constitutes a worthy contribution. And again, that was conclusion to the utility of religion, Milne, Nietzsche, and James. Thank you.